This is Kimberly with Stroud Water coming to you from beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. We will be sending the slides and the presentation after today's event. It will come to you from the email address healthcareadvisory at stroudwater.com. If you don't already have that list, uh, that email safed or whitelisted, you might want to do that to ensure that you receive the materials. Uh, a little bit of backgrounder on Stroud Water Associates. We are a leading national healthcare consulting firm serving healthcare clients exclusively. We work on strategic, operational, and financial areas where our perspective offers the highest value. We're very proud of our 34-year track record with rural hospitals, community hospitals, healthcare systems, and large physician groups. We have offices in Portland, Maine, Nashville, and Atlanta. Today's speaker is Opal Greenway, and she's in our Nashville office. Opal is an accomplished healthcare and finance professional who focuses primarily on the strategic needs of healthcare service providers. She's an expert in valuations, mergers and acquisitions, strategy, physician comp, and regulatory compliance. She works exclusive, extensively on valuations focused on physician and healthcare provider compensation, hospital service lines, and practice acquisitions. She has advised hospitals and healthcare providers regarding market trends, stark and anti-kickback regulations, and professional service agreements. Her background also includes financial analysis and strategic development for healthcare entities. With that, I'll turn it over to Opal Greenway, who is our presenter for today's webinar. Opal? Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you everyone for joining us today. So today will be a continuation of a series that we have been doing with regards to the toolbox for performance improvement um, in hospitals and physician practices and physician practices that are owned by hospitals. Today's focus will be on those physician clinics themselves and the operational performance of those clinics and achieving st staffing efficiencies there. All right, so um, when we look at today, the, we do a lot of work in the rural space. And when we look at county-owned hospitals, they are primarily in rural locations. And they have some unique aspects that we have to pay attention to that other for-profit or large health system-owned hospitals do not necessarily face. Regardless of how the hospital is owned, when they own physician practices, we are seeing a trend across the country that physician practice losses have reached an unsustainable level. Um, while many expect that this is the norm, it does not necessarily make it sustainable. So today we're going to go ahead and talk about their operational tool toolbox that this is a part of a series of. What is the current state of rural providers as that is impacting whether these losses are being generated? Talk a little bit more about how those losses are happening and what's causing them. And then talk about a plan of action on how we should address that. And then we'll make sure we have time at the end for any questions that people have. So talking about this operational performance improvement toolbox that Stroudwater has been working on, when we look at the things that are impacting healthcare today, there's you have to look at it from both a financial, operational market, and what are the value aspects. These vector, vectors all come together and actually create our strategic and risk um, profile for each one of our health systems. And so today, what we're really focusing is what's going on in the provider practice operational improvement space that's coming at it from both an overall practice management, but also um, achieving efficiencies with regards to your staffing. So those are the two tools we'll be talking about today. And again, those are very much operational. In addition to that, as we've been going through this series, there's different tools that we offer around value, market, and financial operations as well. So talking about a little bit of what's creating the issue here, because understanding the root of the problem helps us understand how we should address it. So overall, we do have a significant physician shortage. Um, so the rules of supply and demand uh, in, are enacted here as they are in other places. And this nationwide shortage hits rural communities particularly hard. As we can see right now, that shortage ranges from anywhere from 42,600 to 121,300 physicians in the next 10 years. And that shortage was creating that huge um, spectrum of what that shortage is is the fact that we don't know exactly what's going on in healthcare. So it's the um, 
the American Medical Colleges that do this um, survey each year, they look at it from a perspective of, does the ACA stay in place? Does it go away? Do we end up with a single payer system? Do we get healthier as a population? Regardless of which scenario they run, we have a shortage. Particularly important to county-owned rural hospitals is the primary care option. That is the healthcare access that we are trying so hard to maintain in these communities. And they have a shortage of 1,480,800 to 49,300. The things that are causing this shortage are the fact that we have an aging population. A lot of our rural communities have a declining overall population. And the only growth is in that 65 plus factor. And those are going to be the high utilizers of our healthcare. On top of that, we have a reduction in the number of hours that physicians are working. So even if you get a new physician in, they are no longer working the same number of hours as previously. And so we're going to need more physicians to replace the population we currently have. With that, we also have a significant number of retirements. And as we figure out population health initiatives, we need to be able to have the right types of physicians to be able to meet these demands. As we look at our specialist supplies, you can see that there's also a huge range in the shortage that we have across the different specialties of physicians. Here, if we do have some significant population health initiatives that become highly effective, we may not actually have a shortage of specialists by 2030 if, um, in the long range. However, you see that that that's really is a rosy scenario and is probably pretty unlikely when we look at what's going on in the future that that, um, that range of specialists that we're going to need is most likely we're not going to be able to meet that overall demand. As I mentioned, a lot of specialists and um, primary care physicians have changed how they practice medicine. We have more and more physicians who are graduating who are now spending their time teaching at academic medical centers, they're um, participating in research, or they're doing other things. And by those other things, there's physicians who are becoming consultants, um, as well as um, who are becoming in that more administrative role. So we're seeing an increase in overall um, physician executives over healthcare systems. Overall, we do still have the majority of physicians are spending the majority of their time providing patient care. Um, primary care is currently 36.9% of all active physicians, and 38% of them are primarily on patient care. So unlike the specialists, more of them are spending their time on patient care overall. But as we see these numbers shift over time, we need to be paying attention to what does this mean for our supply of physicians that we have access to. Um, another note I'd like to point out on this is a lot of physicians divide up their time amongst these different activities. So when we recruit a physician and we come up with our physician needs assessments and our medical staff development plans based off of what we actually need for our patients, keep in mind some of the physicians that we would be trying to recruit may be expecting to spend 10% of their time on administrative duties, or they might be expecting to spend time what they call teaching or supervision of advanced practice providers. And so how much time they actually find out with um, spend with patient care, we'll talk about a little bit more later, but it's going to be an important thing in understanding how many physicians we need in these communities. As I mentioned, rural areas are hit the absolute hardest. When we look at it, when we have a physician leave a rural practice, the lost revenue during that time that actually the physician leaves the practice and we have a replacement in right now is averaging $400,000 per physician. That is the actual lost revenue. That does not include the expense that we incur in trying to replace that physician, expenses associated with recruitment, expenses associated with using locums during that time. That is just that lost revenue is currently averaging that amount of $400,000. So if we don't have our planning in place for how we're going to be able to provide these services, um, an unexpected retirement or an unexpected um, change in our physician makeup can hit us significantly. This ca also causes a delay in getting care. Right now we're seeing in rural communities an average wait time for an appointment for a new patient is around 54.3 days for that in that family practice perspective. Um, a variety of reasons are that delay is in getting that care is we do have physicians who are some, we also have physicians who are being very picky as far as how they're taking on patients and needing to get medical histories in place um, before they're willing to be able to see the patient or depending on who the patient's payer is. So those delays in getting care are imp um, hampering our patient access in these rural communities. and also creates um, poor continuity of care where if a physician suddenly leaves a market, then how um, the different providers that may pick up the slack 
not those records and that history for that patient isn't always transferred properly and we have that poor continuity and so we see those patients in our emergency departments on top of that we also have a lack of specialty services so more and more primary care physicians that are coming out you know have a little bit more of a focused study as opposed to a broad general being able to treat everything and they've become overly reliant in some people's opinions of um, referring any issue out to a specialist. And so when they come to a rural community where there is not a bunch of different specialty services and more of the patient's overall health and having to address more complex issues than they do in an urban environment hinders our ability to recruit into these communities. Um, with that, other things that are making it difficult are the fact that the ma vast majority of physicians that are coming out of medical school these days and out of residency programs are in a dual degree household where that spouse is also a hot, um, expected to have a high paying job in a profession such as um, attorneys, engineering, lawyer, um, and do uh, fellow doctors, et cetera. And so being able to have that kind of employment for the spouse, you really are recruiting now an entire family to a community rather than focusing on just the individual physician. So we can also talk about how we can use that to our benefit, um, but it's another snafu that's we have to take into consideration our physician recruitment as if we're going to be able to have sustainable financial practices. Um, with that, there's also the lifestyle impact, call schedules. Most places that if you're in a rural community, you know that an OBGYN does not want to be on call 24-7, 365 um, to be able to be responsible for all the babies in the community. And knowing that, do we have to have an extra OBGYN or do we have to have find family medicine that can do OB? Same with general surgery. Most people do not want to be on that one and two call rotation when they've become accustomed to even in urban areas, a one and six rotation. So even being able to understand that we have this expense of being able to do one and three rotations when our services overall probably can only keep one physician or one and a half physicians busy, we may need three just because of the call schedule. Um, that being said, you know, the use of advanced practice providers can actually really reduce the strain that we have on these shortages. You'll see that the states that are highlighted in green are full practice states where that state allows you to use an advanced practice provider to the full extent of their license, as opposed to the states that are listed in red, including where I'm located here in Tennessee, where the extent that that primary care provider who is an advanced practice provider, that would be a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, cannot do the full scope of what their license is allowed to do. They have to be heavily um, supervised by a physician. Physicians need to be on site at all times. And so being able to use them for outreach communities, being able to use them to be able to give a lot of your primary care, being able to use a nurse practitioner hospitalist model becomes very limited if you're in a state that has restricted practice. So if you are in a state that allows full practice, one thing I would caution in thinking about how we can we use APPs that are significantly less expensive than physicians um, to be able to provide some of our care is to pay attention to your payer contracts. Payer contracts are notorious for being more restrictive than the state licensing board itself on how you can use them, or they allow you to use them, but they the execution of that contract and the implementation to be able to get payment for the services provided becomes limited without significant amount of extra coding and billing that has to go on. So even if you're in a fully licensed state, that does not mean that you know it's a free for all and using these APPs to reduce that strain. Um, but at least the one good news with that though is that the APP supply is growing. Um, more and more people are actually deciding to go into the nurse practitioner physician assistant realm. There's a lot less student loans associated with that. And um, the, we're seeing the compensation for APPs uh, grow as well. So bottom line with regards to that before we talk specifically about the practice operations is the fact that we need to always have our medical staff development plan in place. We have to always be recruiting physicians because it's so disruptive. It's so difficult for places to be able to get that physician and, and how disruptive it, disruptive it is if the physician leaves, we can't afford these vacancies. I was actually recently with a hos uh, hospital in the past couple of weeks that had five unexpected vacancies that all, were, that all came in between retirements, mission work, et cetera, that physicians were wanting to go do. And that was going to give them all of a sudden, you know, in a six-month period, they were going to lose five physicians. And 
we're stuck in a place of what are we going to do other than provide a locum. And there was going to be some competition in the market. It puts them in a bad position. On top of that, their medical staff development plan was very outdated and they hadn't begun recruiting for some of these were probably foreseeable. But because they did not have an active medical staff development plan, because they were not engaging with physician leadership to understand the environment that was going on in their own community, it puts them in a really bad position and they are going to have to use locums for a period of time while they get themselves regrounded in trying to figure out how to recruit practices. On top of them, it has increased their risk profile of having to recruit people that might not be a good long-term fit, but they're just wanting to get a body in the door very quickly. And so sometimes you don't always make the best recruiting decisions. That being said, let's talk a little bit now specifically about the practices and the operations that are going on there. So as I mentioned, practices are, it is the very much the norm that practices are losing money in the actual clinic. The reason for that, there's a variety of reasons, whether it's taking out the ancillaries, it's increasing the sufficient comp, it's not doing proper due diligence, just because it's the norm does not make it sustainable. Losing $197,000 per physician is not a sustainable model for anyone. That number has been increasing and increasing year after year, and it's making things very difficult for these practices. Some of these things can't be prevented or they're done before the physician ever gets there or before the hospital buys up the practice. You know, things like the fact that a physician may, who, who historically had a profitable practice, had a, did not provide benefits to their staff and now being part of the hospital, they have to provide benefits. There's not really anything we can do about that, but there is a matter of things that we can tackle, right? And those are the things that I have listed here in blue. The ones that are listed in red are the things that are gonna have the biggest financial impact that you can actually impact with regards to your physician practices and actually the operations within them. So making sure you tackle those where I like to look at this from a triage perspective of let's think what can we get the biggest bang for our buck quickly that we can actually impact that's most important that's hitting us the hardest and work our way down. And from that perspective, obviously we have to talk about the physician spend. So what we spend on physicians and what we spend on staff are two of the really big things that are going to hit us um, incredibly hard since they're the largest expense in any one of these practices. When we think about providing quality patient care in our practices, practice management encompasses all of these things. So, so many groups that we have worked with, especially um, in these county hospitals, they have all these different bubbles are handled by different parts. They've over consolidated. They have, you know, um, the people who typically have this job in the hospital also handling it for the practice and there's not this communication that's going on. So somebody is handling ancillary services. Another person's responsible for the telephones. Another division is handling marketing for the overall, for the hospital. Um, and somebody else is doing entirely dealing with the payer contracts. Another group's dealing with the scheduling and the appoint appointments. And very rarely am I actually seeing in these rural and county owned hospitals, somebody who's keeping their eye on for the, from the physician practice perspective on all of these different balls. Right, and so with them all being in different parts and it being somebody else's job, then these things do not get integrated well and that costs a significant amount of money, but it also impacts the quality of patient care that we're able to deliver. So before we dig into these things, um, I have a polling question that Kimberly is going to ask just to get an understanding of where people are. Thank you, Opal. Um, get everyone's fingers awake and off their caffeinated beverages. Um, you have a poll that's coming up on your screen now. Um, what is the average level of losses in your clinic per provider? Please select one. Um, you've got less than 150K per provider, 150 to 220, 220 to 300, more than 300 per provider, or we don't track this metric, I have no clue, is also an option. So, give people a few seconds to offer their insights. It looks like we're coming in a dead heat between less than 150 per provider and not tracked. So I'm going to close out of this now. Looks like we have most people. And share it with everybody. 
So you'll see the results here, 33% coming in at less than 150 per provider and 41% at um, no tracking metrics. Back to you, Opal. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, well, I have to say that not tracking is very common. And part of the reason for that is um, what we have here is the ex understanding the true expenses of a practice, right? Of when a practice before it's purchased and then when the, they go into an employed model state, a lot of places that do have these practices are not able to do full expense accounting on the um, for the practices. They're usually doing it trying to do FTE allocations. They're like, okay, this is not included in here. The salary is expensive. Um, we have people in the practices who may wear multiple hats, but they are either captured in the practice or they're captured elsewhere. And so that we don't have true P&Ls in a sense by provider or by location. And so people just glop all these expenses and all the revenue together and try to divide it by the number of providers. And that's a good way of looking at it just so you have an idea. But the problem is, is that you miss different things that when you do it that way. Some of the things that people will say um, when we're dealing with is physicians are like very much, I had a successful practice and then when I came to the hospital, you know, all of a sudden they're complaining about losing money. How does that happen? And so here we have a side-by-side -side comparison of some pro formas of what happened. So increasing the staff adjustment, the fact that now you have to pay rent at a fair market value to be start compliant, right? That you have IT costs and hospital allocations, management fees, et cetera. When those things get added in and also any potential revenue associated with the ancillaries usually gets captured elsewhere in the hospital, then we start seeing differences in what the practice was prior to becoming employed versus after the physician becomes employed. One of the big things that I see, like I said, we're talking about what are the two most expensive things in the practice, the physician salaries and then the staff salaries. So the, um, with the physician pieces, knowing your contracts, having them standardized is absolutely critical. A lot of these county owned hospitals, if we have if we have the benefit of having providers who've been in the community for a long time, their contracts were, re were negotiated a long time ago and they don't get updated or they're missing or they're done. On top of that, you have um, community members who are part of your county owned hospital board. And oftentimes that board is who's supposed to be in charge of overseeing physician compensation. And there's a little side deals that happen. It happens all the time. You may be nodding your head or, or you might be sitting there and shopping like, how could that even be possible? But it does happen all the time, um, especially in these smaller communities where everyone talks with what everyone else and it's easy to call up, you know, your board chair and tell them, you know, that they you're not happy with your physician contract and you would like some sort of change to happen with that. Um, and or we have our contracts and we have them standardized, but we did not make sure that they make sense for our market and actually pay attention to the stark and the kickback laws. We did have a group that I was working with in um, in the southern Midwest uh, about a year or two years ago where they had a great contract in place that was standardized. They got a fair market value report, but because they weren't really making sure that everything lined up between the report and the actual contract between the physician, there were discrepancies in there and the physician ended up because they were a very high producer um, ended up with a overall compensation that was well exceeded the cap that was in their fair market value report they had taken the compensation per work review out of the report but not put in that cap language and the consequence was this is cardiology so they ended up with compensation that was well above what they were allowed to pay under stark and anti-kickback rules but they were contractually obligated to pay that physician that amount so as you can imagine, once we undercovered this, there was a big issue of having to ask the physician if they could pay some of it back or do we do self-disclosure, you know, what are the what are our different options? Either way, it wasn't going to be a good scenario. So we did get, we did come up with a result of where we were asking the physician to pay it back over time um, so that we, we could be in compliance with Stark and Anti-Kickback. They did do some self-reporting and on top of that and had to restructure all their contracts going forward. Um, with that, with regards to compensation, we're seeing a lot of groups that haven't updated their compensation plan and they think that to be able to get a physician, um, they need to do a guaranteed base salary. That's very common, but it should really only be in place for about two years. And we're seeing, we're going places where they have five, seven years of guaranteed base and they never move things towards productivity. And whether that productivity is work RVUs for specialists or panel size for primary care, 
you know, I'm one of those people I say, don't spend money on something that's not going to generate an ROI for you. So if you're trying to incentivize physician compensation and you're trying to put in incentive comps, you have to step back and think, what are we actually trying to incentivize? Is it, are we very much still in a fee-for-service model for our hospital? And so we need to have it to incentivize a fee-for-service model and go off of productivity. Or do we need to, if we're more, further along on an AC, with an ACO or different value-based contracts, how do we put in the different quality components and how, how, what quality components make sense for how the hospital is paid versus how we should be able to pay for the physician? So it's absolutely critical while it's still currently a very small amount that is tied to quality for physicians, that number is absolutely increasing. And as we pay attention to going forward and we think about our contracts going forward, we have to think about how we as the hospital are going to be reimbursed. Um, and one thing that happens with these county-owned hospitals is a tendency to put your head in the sand because you might have um, a mill levy or something else that's showing up that covers the revenue that keeps the hospital afloat. We don't know that those are always going to be in place. And so we have to make sure we our compensation is constantly evolving for how we as a hospital are generating our revenue. That being said, um, what we have to also deal with is what are the physicians actually, actually looking for? Sometimes it's not just throwing out more money. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it is other things that we can take into consideration, whether it's helping them find a job for their spouse, giving them some sort of housing allowance, you know, trying to help them find what is going to be a good um, place in the community for them to practice, giving them flexible scheduling, all those different things. We need to think about all the tools we have in our toolbox, not just how big of a check can we write in order to be able to recruit these physicians. No matter what, when you come up with your compensation model for the docs, they have to be clear and easy to understand. If they are not, if the physician can't sit there and figure out how much they're going to get paid, they're going to be very unhappy with whatever the compensation model is. And it has to make sense, right? You have to meet the commercial reasonableness requirements and make sure it fits in with that. Um, so moving on to the practice management aspect of these clinics themselves, since a lot of the contracts are handled by somebody who might be in the hospital, you know, one of the things I say in looking at trying to assess how your practice is doing and do we have a good holding of our practice and understand what's going on is to step back and really ask ourselves three questions. Do we know what is being done in the practice itself? And that's not just what services are provided, although that's important to know. But we need to know, are we doing the scheduling there? Is that front desk person doing the scheduling or do we have centralized scheduling? Are they handling it in the back? What is actually being done? The billing and coding, have we set completely centralized it where all of our revenue cycle aspects are being done in a centralized place within the hospital? Say we have our revenue cycle team is five people that work together in the hospital and there's nobody in the practice. Or, is there, or do we have a coder in there? Or do we have a... Nurse, um, a registered nurse who's working in the practice and works half time as a coder. What is actually happening in our practice? On top of that, we need to know who's doing what. Um, I was just actually in a practice recently where they're used, for some reason, they are able to recruit a whole bunch of RNs but not medical assistants. And, the re and with that, they have RNs doing a lot of clerical work. So, and I'm not sure that they always realized that that was the case that was going on. And so the different job descriptions that they had with the different places were impacting their ability to recruit the actual staff that they needed. You know, who's and knowing who's responsible for each different piece of what happens in the practice is absolutely critical. And then we have to think about who's really in charge. Is the hospital CEO in charge of everything? No, they usually have to delegate something out. Even if the buck stops with them, they need to delegate to be able to be effective. But when you go into the physician practice, since it's usually in a separate location in the hospital, or even if it is, it's a matter of, is it the physician who is in charge? Is the practice administrator? Who, is, it a, is it a fantastic nurse that everybody respects? Who's truly in charge of the practice? Because as many of us might say, it's our, oh, it's our administrator who then, you know, reports to our director of physicians or to the CEO, something of that nature. But then we actually go into our practice and realize that the front desk listens to the, if the physician says change the schedule, the front desk person listens to the physician, not to whatever template that the practice manager put into place. So we have to step back and think, who is really in charge here? And from that matter, I will say best practices to use a collaborative model. 
right? Everybody should have some ownership of that practice's success, which means you need to follow some sort of dyad structure between physicians and administration and have everybody on board for that overall success of that practice, rather than saying it just needs to be a single head who answers all, who can go to for all issues. One of the things that we're seeing within the practice um, that happens is oftentimes is what's happening with the schedule. You can live and die by your scheduling within that practice. I'm a huge fan of using scheduling templates and making sure those scheduling templates make sense that you engage with physicians in creating them and that they match your contracts. So here we had a group, um, this was in um, upstate New York, that they had they worked really hard on their physician contracts. They said that they all physicians were supposed to provide reasonable full-time hours. Um, they said that, you know what, that's a little bit vague. Let's say we need it to be 36 hours in the clinic. Well, here, when they went and they actually passed those contracts, everybody signed them, but it never made it into the scheduling template. So the scheduling template stayed the same despite the fact that they worked hard on their contracts. And here, when we actually pulled this out of their EMR system, we noticed most of the providers weren't doing 36 hours or reasonable full-time hours. They were only in the clinic less than 30 hours a week. Well, if you take into consideration how much they were getting per patient per week um, on that, having that even just getting it to them to 32 hours per week um, would be a benefit of $217,000. Or if we could get them up to 40 hours, which with this group actually would have been reasonable and this type of clinic that they were in, of, because they had extend, they were supposed to do extended access hours, it could be $600,000 of benefit. So patting yourself on the back for getting in really good at contracts is fantastic, except for we have to make sure those things actually get operationalized, right? We don't make changes for the sake of making changes. We have to make sure the changes that we make, if it's, especially if it's in a contract, that it actually gets executed. And who's responsible for that, right? This is where I say you can live or die by your schedule is who is truly responsible for getting that in there. Is it your person who's in charge of your EMR? Is it the practice administrator? Is it the front desk people? And knowing who's responsible to make sure that happens. Um, here, this is that group, that same group, when we looked at there was an overall performance improvement project. We looked at fixing their collections. We looked at um, doing some expense reductions. But those impacts overall, I mean, on the loss per physician under these different scenarios, it was going to be huge, and you see how they, we go from very unsustainable pro projected loss of 731000 to all of these different improvements of actually operationalizing them. We end up with a loss that's a lot more manageable for us going forward. So one thing I will note on that is if you people think, okay, let's just fill up the schedule. Sometimes you have to make investments in order to be able to fill up that schedule and being to pay attention to what your patient access issues are here. In this case, we knew that we needed, if we were going to increase the number of physician hours, we had to have additional staff to provide those services as well. So you see on there that we actually increased, we gave, gave them um, another middle, um, sorry, um, certified medical assistant for when we went to 32 hours and we actually put in two of them in there for when we went to 40 hours per week because otherwise we were going to end up in a situation where physicians were just going to be waiting. They were going to have those hours because there was nobody there to room the patients or we're going to be using a very expensive resource of having a physician room their own patients. So keep in mind what are the resources that you need to actually operationalize things, things and be realistic and understand sometimes you have to spend a little bit of money of hiring a medical assistant if you necessary to be able to make much more money for that practice. So with that, before we get into more of the staffing efficiencies, I think we have another polling question. We do. Um, let's launch that and get everybody back to their keyboard. What tools are you using to check patient flow? You can select as many of these as are pertinent. Uh, you're tracking scenes, scheduled, canceled, and no-show appointments by provider. You're using a scheduling template. Um, you're using a time motion study to optimize workflow and remove inefficiency. Or you're not sure or you don't have anything in place to check patient flow. So we'll give people a couple seconds to give their feedback. Right now we're running 68% uh, for the first option of tracking scenes, scheduled, no-shows, and cancellations. 
followed closely by scheduling templates. And about 18% are saying that they don't use anything or they're not sure. So give people a couple more seconds. It looks like we have most people have chimed in and we will share this with you all. All right, yes, yeah, 64% are uh, the first option, um, followed very tightly by scheduling templates. Uh, time motion is the least utilized, and then 16% saying there's nothing in place. Back to you, Opal. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I have to say that 16% doing time motion studies um, isn't surprising. That's very rare to be used on a regular basis. Most people haven't seen them. I will say doing a time motion study of actually how you're spending every hour within that practice is a fantastic way to find out whether or not your workflows and any of that are actually making sense. Realistically, I know that a lot of people are not going to take the time to do that to actually truly optimize their performance, but they but having certain tools in place should be a baseline minimum to be able to ex, um, at least know that you're operating at a decent level. So one of the things that we pay attention to is what is your overall patient throughput? This is a separate practice, different than the ones we were talking about earlier. Um, this one was in the Midwest where we had a number of different providers. We looked at what, how much time were they spending FaceTime with patients each week. Some of that was, and we knew it was gonna be hospital rounding. Some of that was in the practice. Some of that was in surgery, um, in the ORs for some of our specialists. So we also looked at their scheduled clinic hours and calculated out how many patients on average were they seeing per hour um, and versus how many were they actually scheduled for per hour. In this situation, we had a number of practice um, people who we're very against double and triple booking patients, which is considered best practice for your high no-show populations, such as Medicaid. And um, and they were against that. And then they realized it would be too full. What if all three people show up? Well, realistically, that doesn't happen. There's a reason why certain patients, it is appropriate to double or triple book and having that into a template. Um, but here, what we were looking at was like, okay, what do we see across your different providers? I personally, with rural um, clients, don't like using just national metrics out there because they may not be relevant. So I like looking at our own internal benchmarks and seeing, okay, on average, how many are we actually scheduling for the different types of providers? How many are we actually seeing by provider? What happens if everybody could actually achieve what we internally have as an average? So what we did, that same practice, we looked at and we said, okay, overall, the patient throughput per hour was 1.1 patients per hour. That's not very much. If I used, if I went into there and said, no, we need to hit national metrics and we need to go onto what are called 1530 templates and have everybody see at least three patients per hour, it would be highly overwhelming. You could see here, even our top pro, um, producers, nobody was hitting three patients per hour. So to set, tell somebody who's only seeing one patient every two hours, and now you need to see three patients per hour, we would have had a definite revolt within our medical clinic here. Um, this group also had a bunch of revenue cycle issues, but we said even if we set, kept everything else the same, but we just hit our own internal benchmark of trying to get everybody up to 1.1 patient per hour and being able to uh, actually hit that metric with how many, what our actual average throughput was in our average reimbursement, that's over a half million dollar opportunity. And this is a circumstance where we had a community who said we have patient access issues, that we can't get into the practices, there's not enough slots open, so we're gonna go to the competitor. This was not something where the reason why we see one patient every two hours is because there's no patients to be seen. Um, I always advise when you're doing these kind of tracking, make sure that this is supposed to guide you to look at what the problem is, not just make assumptions about what the problem is. Using this kind of data told us, once we looked at this, we said, okay, why do we only see one patient for every two hours, right? Is it because there's no patients there? Or is there things that are hindering our workflow? Is it because we're scheduling administrative time and, you know, with the physician having to go to the hospital for a meeting in the middle of the day, so between travel time, et cetera, we're not able to schedule patients? Or is it because of what the workflow is? I always like to start out with what are the things, tackle first what we can operationalize that does not change how the physician actually interacts with the patient, because I'm not a clinician and I'm not gonna tell a doctor union to change how you see patients. I'm gonna start with things such as this um, that we can operationalize and then ask the physician to give on their on their side of things. Um, on top of that, 
We also looked in this practice at the number of cancellations and no-shows. Right now, the industry median for multi-specialty is having no-shows of 6%. When we pulled this up out of their Meditech, their no-show rate is like, hey, fantastic. You have a pretty good um, no-show rate across your different practices. Um, but we do have a lot of cancellations and we had a lot of people rescheduling. So when we noticed that the fact of the number of actually percentage of attendant patients, most of the providers were less than 80% of their initially scheduled patients were they actually seeing. Well, we spent time in the practices and we realized that each provider itself was, while they had a no-show policy that had been passed, it wasn't actually happening across the board consistently. A lot of providers, because they were concerned about, you know, if they had a three-strike rule where if a patient no-showed three times, they would get a discharge letter saying they were no longer going to be a patient of the practice. So to override that, we had several different physicians telling people, oh, as long as they're here, you know, if they, if they call and cancel within 15 minutes after their appointment was supposed to start, then just put them as a cancellation rather than a no-show. Most places, might, their, um, their actual no-show policy as a hospital was if you canceled less than 12 hours in advance, you were supposed to be a no-show. But people were overriding that policy on a regular basis. So when we looked at no-shows and cancellations, you can see here almost every group was having a very high no-show no and cancellation rate. And it, it was very much just driven off of the fear of discharging patients. The problem with that is that we had a long wait list. And so when we don't, and we, when we're concerned about that, and saying everybody should be a cancellation rather than a no-show, it does not give adequate time to reschedule somebody who's on the wait list who wanted to get into the practice. So it's hampering our, our patient access, it's hampering our um, workflow, and these patients who can't get in because we can't get them off the wait list show up in our emergency room or they go to, the comp uh, go to a competitor. So that's why it's so important. With that, when we look at our staffing, you know, we have to make sure that we have um, basic scheduling and workflow pieces that are in place, right, for effective practice management. And on top of that, I like to tell people, people do what is inspected, not as what expected. Just because you pass a policy does not mean that it's going to actually have any impact whatsoever if you're not enforcing it. So don't pass policies, just pat yourself on the back to say, look, we have policies and protocols in place, if you're not actually making sure that they're happening. One piece of that with workflow that impacts our staffing levels that we need is having just basic checklists of making sure that certain things are done every single, the same way every single time. You and people think, oh, well, it's degrading to have a checklist. You know, we should be able to trust our people to be able to go through and do what's necessary of them. Even pilots have a checklist who fly a plane every single day is so that you don't miss things. Right. So ha when you have a policy, have the, your standard process for how do you create an appointment? How do you delete an appointment? What is your cancellation no-show policy? How do you collect patient balances? And all these different pieces so that you can monitor when things are not going well in your workflow. Um, again, moving on some more to the staffing efficiencies and where these actually play with productivity that we were talking about with the physicians and their compensation earlier on is understanding what are the appropriate staffing levels are absolutely critical. Here's a group that, um, that had a lot of RNs and couldn't get medical assistance. For, there was a nursing school that was in the town that they were in, so they were able to get a lot of RNs. And so when we looked at this from an overall perspective, we saw that if based off of the number of providers they had in this situation, you know, they were understaffed on certain pieces, but overstaffed on nursing, because the nurses were actually being it, providing the front office and clinical support positions, same with the medical assistant positions, were very much being done by RNs. That is a very expensive resource. And so understanding what that expense is and realize if that's the reality of your market, okay, that becomes all that much more important that we optimize workflow and have job descriptions actually in place to be able to manage that resource. But on top of that, we need to encourage our physicians and make sure we put things in place to incentivize them to hit different productivity parts. Here we had staffing that was based off of, you know, the number of providers that they actually had. But when we looked at the productivity and said, based off of how you're doing your, um, how many patients you're seeing, you actually have, you have a lot more staff than you would need, even if everybody was hitting their productivity metrics. 
So how can we have make sure that things are lining up in a way that actually makes sense? Do we have the right people for the job to be able to monitor this and man manage what our actual labor spend here is in this um, in this clinic? Um, and because it wasn't on site of the hospital, right? The clinic was a few miles down the road from the hospital. Nobody was really responsible for paying attention to this. And if you're not paying attention to this, you can't actually make any sort of changes or realize what's going on. You're just seeing your provider losses increase and increase. So as I mentioned earlier, part of it is who's in charge, but then who's in charge of the staff, right? Of the actual people, the boots on the ground there. Who does the front desk person actually report to? Do you as a practice, do you have managers or do you have supervisors? What level are you able to get into your community? Or do you have an administrator? Or do you just have a head you know, who's your clinic lead. One thing I know is that there is a difference between somebody who manages a practice versus somebody who supervises a practice. A supervisor in that practice, they're gonna make sure scheduling, they're gonna be able to explain when there's a variance to budget. They're gonna say, oh, somebody called in sick, let me find somebody. And they're gonna give you the reports that you need. Versus somebody who feels that is empowered to actually be a manager of the practice is going to be invested in the success of that practice. They're going to say, hey, I'm going to do, they're gonna look at their workflow. They're gonna say, "What does, is this actually optimized? If it's not, how can we fix it? They're gonna go and talk to the doctor saying, hey, I noticed that you always have this on your, uh, this on your schedule. What can, can we move that to the beginning of the day so that doesn't disrupt patient flow? Can we move it to the end of the day, et cetera? Um, there, something comes up and they're going to deal with it then rather than wait until somebody at the hospital calls up and says, we see an issue, right? And on top of that, they're going to think more strategically. Not all of our rural communities can find these people, but knowing the difference of and setting the expectation can move mountains with regards to how effective your workflow and what your staffing numbers are. If you can actually encourage people and actually put into there when you're trying to find somebody, put it in the job description that here's what we're actually looking for, rather than um, expecting, okay, we just want somebody, because I've seen these job descriptions on a regular basis that say you will reproduce reports, that you're gonna monitor the schedule, that you're gonna be in charge of the staffing levels, et cetera. Um, and then assuming that somebody who's not in the practice, that's over in the hospital, is doing the management aspects. Realistically, if you do not have somebody who is regularly seen in the practice, seen by the staff, seen by the physicians, communicating and engaging with them on that regular basis, you're going to end up in a supervision position and it's going to cause, um, mean that you're not gonna be managing those loss as well. So what do we do about all of this, right? When we see the practice losses, some people have, the, uh, they think they have the perfect solution. Well, it's simple, we'll just work harder. Physicians, we're just gonna need you to see more patients. That's uh, um, and if and if you don't, we'll go find somebody else who will. That's usually not the best plan of action there. As you, we talked about earlier, it's hard to, to recruit physicians. If physicians just leave, it takes a long time to get there. It costs us a lot of money. We lose out on a bunch of revenue. There are things that, impact, that happen in the clinic that imp, um, impact your productivity. Do you know what it is? Do you know what's impacting the productivity? And don't assume that your physicians are just lazy and that nobody works as hard as they used to. That's not usually the case. I was just in the practice Monday night. We had a great work session of trying to come up with an implementation plan to address several of these issues, recognizing it had to have finance. It had to have the staff in the clinic. It had to have the physicians. Everybody came out of that room on Monday night energized to be able to tackle and realize that everything we wanted to change involved everybody participating. It wasn't one person's problem, it was everybody's. So we need to understand as a group within the hospital and the practices, what's causing low productivity, what's causing low revenue, those different pieces and engage together to figure out what the solutions are, rather than just assuming what they are and assigning a physician to take care of it, right? The physicians I work with, they love to triage and treat, right? Whether that's patients or you've given them some sort of problem and we have to work together to come up with a solution with that. So that being said, you know, people who are concerned saying, well, my physicians just don't care that we're losing the money in the practices. That's not their problem. They are here to see patients. And so what's going on with the finances are not their issue. Most physicians actually will really engage if you give them the right tools you should be giving them a monthly and weekly dashboard at the very least that has information about what's going on in the practice. 
whether it's their productivity, even if they're not paid on productivity, explaining to them that we need their set of eyes to, um, I had a group where we saw that we were going to transition the physician over to a work RVU contract and he wanted to make sure things were accurate. And we were looking at the work RVU report and noticed that there were, but hey, this is an OBGYN, there were a bunch of the babies missing. We knew he delivered about 150 babies in the past um, nine months, but only 74 were showing up on the report. Where were the babies? Nobody would have caught that if the, we didn't sit down and engage with the physician about whether or not the work RVUs were correct. This only happened because we were changing the compensation structure. But what if we weren't changing the content, um, compensation structure? What if he was staying on his base guarantee? And your physicians need to understand why it's important to pay attention to this, even if that's not how they're paid, right? So that you can check what was going on. It turns out a lot of the um, antepartum and postpartum these pieces were not properly billed underneath the, the global payment for the babies. So it was all that was missing. That was revenue that what that the hospital missed out on. Doesn't impact the physician's paycheck, but the physician sure as heck cared whether or not the hospital was getting paid for the work he was doing. Um, on top of that, having physicians engage them around the financials, you have to give them a baseline education so that they know what they're looking at. They have to understand what is revenue, what is AR, what, this is why it matters. Because to assume that the physicians know this stuff if you're not going to give them the base education on it, is a huge misnomer. Most medical um, programs that I've worked with in the past do not give physicians any sort of business planning. They don't teach them about contracts. They don't teach them about how to run a practice. So they come out of medical school and they're like, well, I better just go become employed because I have no idea how to run a practice. So you have to give your physicians a base level of understanding and education about why something is important how it impacts the bottom line, how it impacts their paycheck, if you want to be able to engage with them. Don't just hand them a report and say, well, I give them reports and they don't ask any questions. It would be like handing somebody an x-ray and say, well, read this and tell me what the problems are. You, did the, you don't expect the physicians to do that to you. You can't do that to the physicians. There has to be this communication. It has to be regularly and make sure that education level is always up there to be able to have impactful engagement with the physicians on these different pieces. So I have a to-do list for everybody who is on this call in understanding what's going on in your practices. If you're going to actually improve those loss ratios, for those of you who are not tracking at all, you know, when you get back to your hospital later today, take out your pen and pencil um, and paper and your calculator and calculate how much you're losing right now, okay? I mean, that, that's step number one. So it's just to understand the position that you're in right now. For those who are already doing, make sure you understand why you are having those losses. What's causing them? I know it, don't just accept, oh, well, everybody loses money um, within the clinics. We're making it up on the downstream. That assumption is how we end up seeing our margins erode um, you know, year after year after year to the point where now we're in a panic attack mode because we know it's not sustainable. Work with your entire team to come up to what, what this, um, the problem is, right? Sometimes you need an outside objective party to come in and tell you, you know, tell you that your baby's ugly, unfortunately, but sometimes that's what it takes. Um, but you have to have everybody on board in understanding that. So look at all the different pieces. Look at your contracts. Look at your compensation plan. Like I said, you can live or die by your scheduling. Make sure you know what's in the schedule and how it's generated and who's in charge of it and who can impact it. Understand your staffing pieces. Um, it was a different webinar. We talked a little bit more about payer contracts and the revenue cycle process. So um, you can go back and look at um, one of those webinars to get into a little bit more about those details. And then actually we, have, we talked about the physician dashboard, but you, whoever's in charge of your practices, whether it's the administrator or your COO or um, your clinical lead, have them, they need to have their own management dashboard that they engage with to be able to track trends understand what best practices are, but again, understand your own internal benchmarks before you know worrying about whether or not you're in a national medium. But here are some of the different things that I like to put on a dashboard, at least as a starting point, start tracking the trends within our own clinics um, that are going on there. Um, to wrap things up before, because I want to make sure we have some time for some questions, some key takeaways you have to be recruiting. Where are you on your medical staff development plan? Is it, is it using current methodologies? If your medical staff development plan does not address the ability to use advanced practice providers to fulfill some of your needs, 
your medical staff plan is using an outdated methodology. That methodology has not been current for a while. I highly suggest you get an updated medical staff development plan or do one yourself. Make sure it actually makes sense and it fits in line with the overall strategy for the hospital. Okay, recruit and prioritize according to that medical staff development plan and always try to be ahead of that game because you don't know what's going to be happening. You have to engage with your physicians and what their plans are so that you're taking that into consideration in that medical staff development plan. Don't just accept your losses for what they are and say, well, that's that's the state of the world and everybody has that problem. Because there's a re if it's median, that means people are doing better than that. And those who are doing better than that and actually are understanding and addressing it on a regular basis, they're on a path to financial sustainability that those of us who are putting our head in the sand are not. Make sure you are, so a lot of people have read the book, Measure What Matters. There's a reason why it's out there. You have to know what your metrics are and you have to be paying attention to them at the very minimum on a monthly basis. I have seen some of the people who are really advanced have their EMR system set up where they get daily reports. That is the rarity. I can tell you that right now. Most people only look at it even quarterly, which is a problem. Monthly, because you're going to have problems with timeliness of billing and other issues that start start to seep in. So you need to do it as at least monthly. There's, there, there's a lot of tools you can set up and people assume, well, my EMR doesn't have it, so I can't get it set up the way I want to. That's a misnomer. Um, you can get these tools set up and work with your different EMR systems. I don't care if you're on all scripts, Cerner, Meditech, Medent. Epic, each one of them does have a different way of doing reporting, but you might have to work with your IT team and your EMR team to be able to figure out how to be able to set up the, re the dashboards the way you need to. And on top of that, finally, make sure you're engaging with the physician. This is everyone's problem. This is not our of the practice administrator's problem. This is not just the physician's problem. This is everybody's problem. And being able to understand that and engage with everyone about that is absolutely critical to fixing the problem. Um, whether you need to use a physician, physician action council, depending on how large your medical staff is, or if it's meeting with the medical staff at least quarterly, but then on a one-on-one -on -one basis, at least monthly, so that they feel engaged in understanding that they are key to being able to um, have the practices operate in a sustainable way and understanding what their position is, that what happens when they tell the front desk person to rearrange the schedule, et cetera, what are the implications for that? But um, I, I have yet to come up with an entire group of physicians where nobody believes it's their problem. Every now and then you have one or two, but it typically, if you can get everybody in the room together, they're, they're willing to work and tackle these together. So that being said, I do appreciate everybody's time today, and I think we have a few minutes before the end to at least take one or two questions. Thank you, Opal. Um, yes, to keep everyone to time, I think we'll go with one question. Um, this is regarding recruitment. We hear a lot about the challenges in physician, in physician recruitment. Can you speak a little bit about recruiting non-clinical staff in rural areas? Um, yeah, so most places have a situation where they can't get nurses, right? They're like, well, I can get a medical assistant, right? But I can't get nurses. And um, so my question with that with that we work on is, okay, what is the nearest nursing school that that you have to your community? What kind of agreements and programs do you have with them? Do you, ha do you allow them to do potential internships or if somebody's even going to do like an associate degree, can they do internships where they can at least start out? Um, I even have used um, people who are about to start college as interns as medical assistants and, and, and encourage them if they're, if they're doing well to get their certified medical assistant piece. And you know, from that, it can create that spearhead towards um, towards wanting to get their nursing license but your relationship with the education program if you have not if you have absolutely none we did have a, a rarity where they actually had as i was talking about earlier a lot of nurses not medical assistants what would it take for the hospital to set up um, some sort of educational program to be able to set these things up so you need to be start getting a little bit creative and look at it similar to your physician problem you need to kind of you have to get them while they're young and push them in the direction you want to but it can be really effective. West Virginia is one of the states where we've had a lot of impact on that of improving um, our recruitment for different providers. And now it's going into the nursing piece. So taking a certain amount of responsibility on the hospital side for that education to create the staff that you want to have um, is important. But that's a, that's a great question. Thanks, Kimberly. All right. 
Well, given that we're coming up to the top of the hour again, um, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. We will be sending out the materials later this afternoon. It will come from the email address healthcareadvisory at stroudwater.com. And we thank you so much for joining us and wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.